Welcome to Secrets from the Scene, a show for local musicians who want to improve their music, grow their audience, and learn about Minnesota's music scene. If you're interested in talking about all things music related and meeting interesting people from our local community, you're in the right place. Welcome back to Secrets from the Scene. On today's episode, we have Joey Vesuvius. Joey works for the company Wasted Potential and has toured around the world as a professional live sound engineer. He's mixed front of house for artists such as JPEG Mafia, Keshi, Mike Studd, Danny Brown, Emotional Oranges, and more, and also at festivals like Coachella. He has a ton of knowledge and a lot of crazy tour stories. I'm excited to learn from him today and to pick his brain about all these experiences. Welcome, Joey. Thank you. Appreciate you uh, having me out. I've been looking forward to it for, for quite a while. I'm glad we could finally make it work. Me too, man. Let's see. I think you're the first live sound engineer. Yeah. So this would be cool. I want to start with what you're up to today because you're working sure. with some really cool artists. You just got off this tour with Keshi. Yep. Why don't you start by kind of talking a little bit about what you do in broad terms and what you're up to now and what you're like looking forward to next? Sure. Yeah. So I guess in layman's terms, let's pretend that nobody has any idea what a front of house sound engineer yeah. does. Let's say you go to see a show at XL Energy Center. Let's say Led Zeppelin's playing there, wh whomever. Basically, the sounds that are hitting your ears in, in the way that they're hitting your ears, that's, that's kind of my job, kind of making everything in the moment blend together, making a cohesive sonic experience. That's basically what my, my job is, is to do. Kind of lately, this is an interesting time of year as we're kind of getting into the holidays and things as far as what I'm up to. Not a lot. This is just <laughs> kind of the slow time of year. It kind of happens to everybody. Like nobody really tours over the holidays and the new year. Big tour season generally tends to be spring into late mid-fall. Yeah, so like my last tour, which just wrapped up, I got back here to Minnesota on December 2nd. That's kind of probably going to be it for me this year. Like I said, because it's a little bit slower and also because my wife and I are working on moving out to the Valley in LA, we kind of want to focus on that for a little bit, especially after a busy tour season, the wife needs some time <laughs> with me as well. So <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm sure that balance is always a, a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So is Wasted Potential based out in California? Yes, it is. It started by a good friend who's become kind of a good friend of mine over the last few years, was introduced to me by another Minnesota native who's a lighting designer. It was started out in Los Angeles. They kind of base there. It's definitely a lot more of a tight knit group than I guess you would think when looking at like the website or just kind of at the scale of things that we tend to do. But it is relatively actually small. But yeah, they are also based out of LA. It's probably going to be the first time ever, I think, that we'll have kind of all of our leads out there, whether that be myself with audio, lighting, video, and you know, production management, things like that. All of our leads are going to kind of be centralized, which is going to be great because then we can spend less time on Zoom calls and actually more time in the office and like communicating with each other directly, which I'm really looking forward to. So when you say leads, yeah. you know, all these other people that are running the other important parts of the show. Sure, yep. How about a little explanation of what all those positions are sure. that it takes to pull off a production like that? Because I think most people can pretty easily grasp like, yeah, you're the guy mixing the show. Yeah. But there's a lot more to it to pull the whole show off yeah. besides the front of house. Right. So these things kind of really scale depending on obviously first and foremost, the size of the venue, whether you're doing things from like a small, very small club level, like 200, 500 cap to like House of Blues size everywhere, basically like 800 cap to like maybe 1500 to places where it's like a larger club space, for example, like First Ave, which is kind of closer to 1500. Those are kind of a lot of the places I've probably in total spent the most time in my career, just because I'm still young myself. Yeah. Getting into those kind of bigger arenas is something that's over the last year or two recently started happening to me, which is great. So all these things kind of depend on that how much budget is going towards the show, the scale of the design, the instrumentation, whether or not it's a hip hop show, is there going to be a band? Is there not going to be a band? Mm -hmm. So for example, I guess one of the artists that I most recently work with, Keshi, I'll just talk about that. We were out in China. Obviously that's a pretty drastic change from touring in the States. So we tried to travel out there relatively light. But essentially what you're looking at for a scale show, 10,000 cap. So you have myself running front of house in the audio world. I have a tech, 
So someone who kind of helps me get things set up, is familiar with kind of my workflow and how I like those things to function, getting my desk set up, you know, basically all those little nitpicky things. Monitor engineer, the person responsible for making sure that the artists and the band members can hear everything appropriately. They also have their own tech. Tour manager, obviously responsible for just managing everything tour related, whether it be travel, artist needs, lodging, communicating with Live Nation, AEG, whoever's buying the show production manager who kind of oversees the entirety of the show and kind of has just a general knowledge, knows a little bit about audio, knows a little bit about lighting, a little bit about video. And they kind of just make sure everything is where it's supposed to be from like a broader place. Mm -hmm. Assistance for pretty much, you know, whoever may need them, things like that. Photography, filmography, all of those types of things. But it also can be just boiled down to the very smallest portion of that. Like, I mean, when I did this tour with JPEG and Danny Brown earlier this year, I mean, I was doing front of house monitors, production management, and playback. And I designed with uh, my counterpart and the lighting designer pretty much the entire stage design. And, And we were doing, you know, club level stuff. So a lot of one to 3K size rooms. So it can really vary a lot as far as budget, things like that. And yeah, what's great about the arena stuff is everything's very delegated, which is great. You know, I was out in China and I was like, wow, I show up, I plug in my flash drive, I load up my show file and I'm like, faders up and I'm just, this is all I have to worry about, you know, Yeah, which is great. While I do enjoy the production management, other stuff, that's just, you know, when you can just kind of be in the moment with it, it makes a huge difference, especially when you're on the road for a long time. So, yeah. Well, besides you touched on this, besides the front of the house mixing stuff, you also do, what were you saying? It was production management, but the show design? Yeah. 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 So that talk about that. Yeah. So a lot of times, especially during this time of year, like I said, because not a lot of people are touring, but what a lot of people are doing is kind of getting geared up for next year's stuff. Mm -hmm. So what comes with that is stage design, meaning how an artist is going to kind of present themselves on whatever scale tour that they're doing. What lighting package are they going to use? How is it going to be kind of like arranged? Are there any set pieces? Things like that like, you know, Taylor Swift's tour, like somebody designed how that was going to kind of flow. It's not just like Taylor Swift's doing an arena tour. This is the arena tour thing that we use. Like, obviously not everybody uses the same stuff. There's a creative design aspect that goes along with it. So that's something I've kind of recently sort of dabbling in over the last year, year and a half. And the first one that I toured with was with JPEG and and Danny. So kind of like just basically designing the lighting, the set pieces on the stage and how they physically appear to the audience. Nice. Is it basically just the visual elements or is it also the the whole act in terms of like um it, no, it's generally not the whole act. It can scale to that, but in this instance it, it wasn't that. It was kind of just building the stage and the artist was kind of dictating how they were going to approach it. Um there are a lot of tours and, and artists that like to kind of dabble in those theatrical elements where there's more like movements and like setting the scene and things like that. But in this instance, the one that I'm talking about specifically, it was just kind of like a static build with truss lighting and a video wall, you know? So it was, yeah. but yeah. Getting the basic layout essentially. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Let's kind of work backwards now to how you got to this stage. Take us through where you started education wise, maybe, and how the sort of journey has been through the ranks to get to the point where you're you know now starting to mix stadiums yeah um like a like a lot of people that are in the industry i started off like you know as a musician which you know i still play myself and Mm. what do you play play drums and keys but i've also just been like writing music and producing for a long time that's ultimately how i ended up getting into this is my brother you know had like pro tools whatever negative 10 (laughs) (laughs) like a decade ago and I just saw him dabbling with like an APC and like, you know, creating music that way. And that ultimately got me into like the engineering aspect of things and like mixing and things like that. So it was pretty clear that that's kind of what I wanted to pursue out of the gate, pretty much starting in middle school and then high school and things like that. So when I decided I was going to go to college, it was a pretty easy choice. Honestly, I thought I was going to be doing studio work because that's originally what I was aiming to do. But I kind of got thrown and fell into mixing live a lot. And I think a big reason for that was just the spontaneity. But basically, I went to school at Hennepin Technical Institute for audio production engineering. And they had this articulation program where if you go to 
Mankato State after getting your associates. You can go to Mankato State for two years and get your bachelor's in music industry. So it's basically you get an associate's and a bachelor's for four years of school. Mm -hmm. I don't even think they do that anymore. But at the time, it seemed like a good idea because when I finished up tech school at Hennepin Tech, I didn't really know what I wanted to do yet. And I didn't really like have like a clear path. And I was like, I'm just going to keep going down this road. And like, this is just like kind of an easy you know, string to pull at. So let's, let's just go down there. And I'm glad I did. I mean, I also ultimately ended up meeting my future wife and a lot of like my closest <laughs> friends, but yeah. So then went down there, finished, finished that music industry degree. And then that's where things definitely got confusing and there wasn't really a clear path anymore. So at that point, what I kind of did was look for internships that made sense. And honestly, a lot of internships that didn't make sense. I thought I might want to get into music supervision even and like working in like film and things like that and kind of helping build audio and and film and things like that. At the time, there was not really any studio jobs that were going to work for me or I just wasn't able to get into them. So I kept searching and searching and I thought I was going to move out to LA and then I didn't move out to LA. And then ultimately, like we talked about a little bit before this, I fell into getting my internship at Electro Voice as a loudspeaker engineer and like tester. So basically working in the anechoic chamber, taking frequency response tests of upcoming releases in their lineup, stress testing, things like that. So a lot of like technical work. That kind of put me back up here in the city with my wife, Sam. And then I was there for probably about a year and a half. Throughout that time though, I wasn't really making great money, obviously, as you can assume, it being an internship. I was searching for something else to do. And so my dad actually was the one who suggested that I kind of start doing stagehand work. So then I started doing stagehand work, working everywhere from Mystic Lake Casino to random corporate events at the convention center in downtown Minneapolis and anything you could think of. And this was probably a few months I started doing this before we had the Super Bowl here, okay, which was massive for, you know, events around the Twin Cities, like everything, corporate events all over the place. And also like a lot of live events. So like, oh, I, f- I forget what the, the the place is called right off 94 there. It's I think I, International Market Square. That's what it is. Yeah. Yep. Lionel Richie played there one night and Migos played there the next night. And I was working there as a stagehand. And that's where for the first time, who's now the lighting designer, the lead lighting designer at Wasted, I met my good friend, Zach. And he was working for Allied Productions in sales, which is based out of Mendota Heights. So Allied Production is where you were doing your stage hand work through, right? Local they were company? they were contracting the people that are like the guy that I worked for, who was basically like a stage hand management company, if you will. Okay. So they were kind of subcontracted through him. Got it. Yeah. So that's ultimately where I met Zach and kind of got an I, you know, a feel for Allied Productions. And I was like, I should apply to work for them. So then I did. And um it timed out great because they weren't gonna let me intern at EV anymore because I was, you know interning there for like a year and a half and they were all very great but ultimately at the end of the day i did not have an electrical engineering degree so it was like you know kind of a requirement even though i was able to hold my own there i suppose to an extent but yeah ended up getting the job at Allied productions as a production coordinator what that means i really still don't fully understand it was kind of i feel like just a a job title slapped onto us but we pretty much did anything and everything you could think of live event related like We ended up getting the contract at the Armory when that first opened up as a live venue. So we spent a lot of time there. Um, A lot of the production stuff that went on at uh, the State Fair, things like that, blah, 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 right? So six months later, Zach, my good friend, decides to leave because he's got a good idea about how he's going to get into the touring industry and kind of built some connections with some other friends that he has and we have. Ended up quitting and started going private. And eventually ended up moving out to LA. And I was like, well, I want to get into touring. And then six months after that, COVID hit, then the world came back. And then I got on touring. And then I was pretty much doing that full time. And then about a year and a half ago, I came on as the Wasted Audio Lead. And now I kind of manage all the staff audio related and kind of keep all that together. So that was kind of a long winded explanation as far as how things came up. But no, I think that's I think it's helpful for people to to hear that. Yeah. You know, that there is sometimes there's just no predictable path. You just sort of 
jump in, take the next best thing you're offered yeah. that's in front of you, make your connections, be a good employee, you know, take advantage of the people that are in your network and keep moving. Because, yeah, I mean, you put all those things together, none of it really makes sense. <laughs> I mean, honestly. But that's the audio world. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I think the main thing to take away from that, and I'm still trying to keep this in the back of my mind now is like I'm, you know, getting older is to just pick something and just keep going. <laughs> you know, I feel like it gets really enticing and easy to kind of just like stop, you know. I think it's good that people do because if everybody just kept going then there wouldn't be really any work for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keeping going whatever it is, like if it, anything that's related to it, I mean just expanding your network is just so massive. I saw one of your Instagram clips of the podcast recently and you talked about it. It was just like, there are thousands of engineers that are objectively better at what I do. But the main thing is just like building the connections with people, being someone that can hang, yes. you know, in whatever capacity that may mean, you know, sitting down, having a beer, relating, not being, you know, an insane person <laughs> on tour. I mean, you're literally, you're literally sharing a 50 by 10 house with 12 other people for months at a time like you can't you just you have to be able to hang and be chill and kind of manage the mental ups and downs that is touring life because it can be a little bit crazy mostly yeah crazy. <laughs> the amount of times i hear that from people on the road especially with how important it is that the people you're traveling with are going to be easy to travel with because mm -hmm. if you have any sort of issue it's a disqualifier <laughs> Immediately. It really is. And I, I just think that point is is always worth re-emphasizing, yeah. which is the music industry, there's probably not any job in it that's going to be merit-based, meaning you got the highest score in this. No. You know, like that's never going to happen. No. So, you know, for people that are going to music school and all that kind of stuff, it's like, sure, do well at what you're doing there. Study hard. But at the same time, it doesn't matter No, nobody, all. Nobody cares. No one cares. No. And nobody's it, asking, like when I, when I'm going to work for an artist, nobody's asking for what my like educational history is. Yeah. Like they're not, Zero they're, not times. They're, they're not asking me that they're asking me, who have I mixed for? That's it. Make a list. And like the years that you did that. Yeah. They, they don't need to see my bachelor's. <laughs> you know? Show me your work. <laughs> yeah. Show me your, yeah. what have you done lately? That's literally it. Yeah. You know, when it comes to applying for a studio or applying for a production company, or any of the other miscellaneous audio jobs, a lot of times like, yeah, resume, sure. But on that resume, first and foremost is what does your portfolio look like? Period. Yeah. And if you don't have anything on there, that's what you have to work at first. You have to take whatever's in front of you, get that down first. So if you start like you did starting local, this is what I can do. I can be a stage hand at these local venues and then I can get to the next step and the next step. You didn't go out and apply to mix stadiums right away. No. It doesn't work that way. No, no. And, and to be honest, I, I feel like this mentality is kind of uh, shifting away, which is ultimately a positive thing. But, you know, when I was, however many years ago, when I was trying to kind of get more into the tech side and step away from the stagehand stuff, a lot of the quote unquote, like veterans that were in the industry at the time are these, you know, older guys, you know, mm -hmm. in their fifties or whatever. A lot of them are great. But there's also this kind of stigma and this like snootiness that I experienced heavily with these guys, like against stagehands specifically. Asking questions to like techs was just like a massive inconvenience for them. And I always hated that, you know, especially now that I'm in a position on, the, you know, on the other side of that coin, I'm trying to tell people not to do like, I'll lose my mind on like techs that I see acting that way towards stagehands. Yeah. Because it's just like, you know, you do get some interesting characters. I'm not going to deny you that. Like, that's 100% factual. There are yeah. some interesting characters. I mean, it's an interesting job. But I think ultimately just treating them with respect is so massive because they're literally doing all the all the stuff that you don't want to do. That's literally the whole thing. Like, I don't want to lift up my 200-pound console and put it on the desk. I'm going to get four stagehands to do it. But I'm going to say, please. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I know it's not fun. Yeah. So... I don't know. Yeah. Well, good on you for, you know, change, working to change that culture mm. because clearly that's only for the benefit of everyone. Yeah. And obviously there's times where, you know, if you are a stagehand or you're an intern somewhere or whatever, yeah. you have to be smart of course. about there are times that 
you know, asking questions is not helpful. Of course. Because maybe they're working. Reading the room. That's massive. Yeah, reading the room. Don't, don't distract people or take up time when there isn't time to be given. Right. But, but obviously if you are a stagehand or an intern, that's what you're there to do is to learn as much as possible. So you should be asking questions and it's just frustrating when the. It's really a talent to be asking them in like a right way too. I think, you know, like approaching people as to not annoy them. Like you want to be as in their face without annoying them as possible. And I think that just applies to any sort of job that you're applying for. When I started, when I tried to work for Allied Productions, like I was on my email maybe once every third day, like hitting them back, hitting them back, hitting them back every time. If you're just sending in like resumes to places and then just like putting your hands up, like, oh, I didn't get it. Yeah, no doubt you didn't get it. I believe you. You should be doing literally as much as you can without them wanting to file a restraining order against you if you want to work there. Sometimes it won't work, but the places where it does work, you're going to really excel there because that's going to be something that they ultimately value. That tenacity, showing up at their office like, hey, I sent in my resume two weeks ago. Just thought I'd come in and introduce myself in person. I bet you seven times out of 10, they will give you an interview right there on the spot. I I would not doubt it. I agree. I love that you bring that up because it's so, so true. And I can think of the amount of times I get internship requests Mm -hmm. that just just get lost because I'm busy. And I got a lot of emails coming in that are that are more pressing at the moment. Yeah. A day goes by, two days, lost it, forgot yeah. about it. Wanted to respond, just forgot. Yeah. How many of them email me more than once? 100%. Like less than 5%. That's probably. crazy. Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> but you, but when you do get that, it's always like, a, okay, they want this. Yeah. I like, forgot oh, about that. This oh, guy. Yeah. What's his yeah. resume again? Right. You know, whatever. Yeah. It's massive. I just think that so many people have the attitude that, it kind of goes back to that merit-based thing. Like, well, they probably looked at it and I probably wasn't qualified. Like everybody, it's just because how we school, you know, like how we grew up thinking of like, everybody gets a grade and it's ranked and stuff. And it's just not, that's not how the world works, especially in the audio industry. No, it's such an outdated way to approach validating somebody too, you know? Well, I think that it's still relevant in certain industries. Sorry, yes. Specifically with what we do for a living, absolutely not. I mean, it literally starts for what we were just talking about. If you follow up with your email, that means more to me probably than 95% of the stuff that you have on your resume. The fact that you followed up, it's like, oh, you're persistent. You actually care about this. Like like we've been you know, saying, it's like, that's massive. Yeah. And bonus points if they actually know something about what they're applying to. I mean, that's great. That's great. It's not just a follow-up like automated, here is this again. It's like, hey, I know what your company does. This is why I want to work there. And so on. Like all of that shows like, okay, this person really cares and wants to be there. They've done their research. They've done research. They've been on the website, you know, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Listen to the mixes, you know, whatever. (laughs) Yeah, 100%. I agree. Well, it sounds like that's worked for you then in terms of your... Yeah, maybe a little bit to a fault sometimes just because, oh, yeah. I mean, my tenacity, I think, has gotten me in trouble sometimes, but I, I think... I bet you come on the uh, on the positive side of that equation, though, I, overall. Yeah, I, thankfully. I mean, I'm 29. I feel like I'm just starting to kind of find a balance on like kind of where to live with that. But that took, you know, 10 years of experimenting with how to like connect with people in a very general way. And then deciding how much I need to calibrate my innate personality in order for them to put up with me being around them (laughs) to where they still want to pay me and like enjoy me being around. Like, you know, there is a very strong bit of that at play for sure. I think that's common with, you know, younger, hungry, yeah, you know, classic kind of interns that are just like, (laughs) <laughs> way too gung ho. Yeah. Like, all right, chill out, man. Relax, man. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. But ultimately, I'd still take that over the opposite of just not being not being tenacious enough, not not looking to help, not looking to to really pursue an opportunity to do work that's not being asked for. Because it's weird. It's weird what we decided to do for a living, like mm-hmm. on both sides. You know, studio work and in the live. Like, there is no guarantee that you know you're gonna myself like there's no guarantee i'm gonna go on another tour ever again and you know there's not necessarily even a guarantee i mean maybe you have some people on the books i'm sure you do but like (laughs) you know what i mean like there's no guarantee that a new client's just gonna come walking through the door like this is you're absolutely right ourselves our product that we individually create is our work like there's no middleman you know Yes. No, no one's going to do it for you. Exactly. You have to show up and you have to be the one who's going to go and create that work, create the demand for yourself. Yep. Yeah. 100%. 
Cool. Well, I want to circle back to your earlier days. Oh, geez. Okay. Doing doing live sound because I think it would be really relevant for the the local musicians listening here. I want to pick your brain about local shows, meaning small shows, right? Okay. Yeah. And you've got one sound guy that does everything, right? Because I know you've done some of those shows in the past. Let's talk about what makes a show successful mm -hmm. from the local sound engineer perspective. Mm -hmm local band perspective. Maybe let's start with what are the things that go wrong the most? I think the biggest one, and I feel like most people can probably attest to this, is just an improper mix on stage. Now, what I mean by that is, let's say you're rocking a four-piece band, you know, drums, bass, keys, guitar, and your wedge mix is just completely all over the place. Mm -hmm. The best way to negate those types of things is invest in your craft especially in those smaller venues where there's only one sound guy and he can't hear what it sounds like up on stage and obviously when you introduce 200 water bags into the room when it's showtime the acoustics of the space change completely so i think as early and as quickly as you can get yourself used to utilizing in-ear monitors the better off that you are going to be because those are not going to change based on what kind of room you were in. Obviously, you're going to be on different wedges, different make, different model, you know, different everything from venue to venue. But if you show up with your in-ears, you can replicate the same show no matter where you are. Yeah. Which is massive. Yeah. Especially in those early stages when you're trying to like, you know, gain ahead of steam and also be comfortable on stage. Like if you're having to deal with stuff that's completely out of your control, like a terrible monitor mix, that's infuriating. And let's be honest, like I wasn't always like good at mixing. <laughs> like, you know, it takes, <laughs> I mean, it, or not yeah. even good. Like I was adequate, but like, there's just, you learn time goes by, you learn how to kind yep. of like approach things. But a lot of people who are mixing in these venues, not all of them, but a lot of them are starting out or just not as experienced, or maybe they do it as a hobby. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't have that innate knowledge about how to approach these types of things. Yeah. So if you can show up with like a rack mounted mixer that already has your ear mixes programmed into it, massive, massive difference. Because that can be the same show everywhere. Agreed. Obviously, that is what you aim for. I think um, obviously, if you have inner monitors, that is ideal. Money. But it's, it's going to be out of reach for a lot of right. people. Yep. And even when you do, there's a huge learning curve of getting those right. Yep. How do they integrate with a really small system? Can they even integrate? Do sure. they have that? To, can they hook us up into this board? Can yep. they not? So let's start with just the basics. Sure. You know, like, okay, there's no in-ears. You're showing up. I have some thoughts on this, yeah. but I'm kind of curious what you think. But maybe I'll start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the number one thing is first, you got to be on time. Oh, God. You got to be on time to sound check because that happens <laughs> a lot. <laughs> People aren't. Make sure you give yourself enough time to park, to figure that out, to figure out load in, all that kind of stuff. If it's a new venue, especially, mm -hmm. so you might have a long haul in and you just got to make sure you give yourself enough time so you can go through a full sound check. Yeah. And then the second thing I think is be respectful no matter what. 100%. Sometimes people are grumpy. That's just going to be the case. Yep. You have to ignore it and keep doing your thing. Be respectful. And try to be as efficient as you can with your time. Don't waste time. Don't waste your sound engineer's time. I think those things go without saying. But I think one of the main tricks is, and this can happen starting in your rehearsal spaces, mm. is that you should set up to try to have your own stage mix working well enough. Now, obviously, this doesn't count towards vocals, mm -hmm. but your amps and drums that stage sound should be as balanced as you can. Mm -hmm. And you can do things, especially when you're playing in smaller clubs where maybe you don't have that many wedges. Mm -hmm. You can tip up, set your amp farther away from you, tip mm -hmm. it up towards your head so you can actually hear what's going on. The amount of times that people have amps cranked with like so bright or so dark one way or another, because it's pointed at their feet, they can't actually hear yeah. what it sounds like. The amps in all these smaller venue, they're going to be louder than the actual PA. Yeah. Put your amp in front of you. Turn it around and face it towards the towards yourself. Use it as a monitor. Use it as a monitor. Yeah. When I was playing more locally in past years, that was kind of a, a big thing for us. It was like how we set up was so important. We had amp stands. We, you know, so everybody could angle an amp back towards the center of the stage so that our stage sound was balanced with no monitors on. Now, again, it doesn't count for vocals. But what that allowed us to do was that the guitarist had his amp pointed at his head. Yeah. He had plenty of guitar. Yeah. He didn't have to put it in his wedge. Right. 
And it was also pointed back towards the rest of the band. So we had quite a bit. You we could, could calibrate. We could calibrate. Mm -hmm. But it allowed them to be more vocal heavy in yeah. the wedges, which was good for everybody. Right. Because what's going to win a guitar or a mic put up to a guitar amp or, a, or vocals trying to push that through wedges? Yeah. I mean, the guitar is going to win every single time. And then the other big thing is keep your stage volume as low as you can. Mm -hmm. People have this stuff cranked up so much that it's louder than the actual PA system. Oh, yeah. And there's so many times I've seen where people, you know, can you turn this down? And some, I have the mic off. You have yeah. to turn your amp down. Yeah. Like you guys have to all play quieter. Yeah. Because it's just too loud for this room. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. You have to, I know it feels good to play really, really loud. Yeah. But if you're struggling with being able to hear accurately on stage, a big piece of that is turn everybody Some down. Some compromises have to be made yeah. always. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've encountered that situation wanting their stage volume. I mean, beyond belief. And especially when it comes to like, a lot of hip hop acts when they're like a little bit more naive and they're not on in ears, you're trying to pump vocals through wedges hotter than you're pumping tracks through and they want the tracks blaring. So you're talking about something that's not going to produce any feedback versus something that is going to produce feedback. And it's just, it's, it's just a losing battle. Like it's, you're not yeah. going to win that. So let's talk about the communication of that sort of soundtrack, because I feel like if you're a band, you're being respectful you know, how do you communicate to your sound engineer or how much should you communicate with your sound engineer during sound check to so basically ask those kind of questions of like, hey, do you need us to change anything up here? Because I feel like that conversation doesn't happen that often on a local level, you know, where the sound engineer says, all right, play, you play, done, next, you know, yeah. and maybe and maybe that's all they needed. But sometimes I wonder if, man, if there was just a little bit more communication back and forth. Yeah. I mean, the sound engineer may not always push for this because they don't care or for whatever reason, especially in these smaller spaces, yeah. like you really don't know what yeah. you're going to get. But for me, if I were, you know, a drummer showing up, you know, local space, whatever, start from the top of the input list, work my way all the way down, you know, the band kick, snare, tom, one, two, three, overheads, left, right, do the whole kit. All right, here we go. Bass, guitar, guitar, keys, check vocals. All right, everybody's hearing it in their wedges. Everybody hears the stuff. All right, now what do you want, drummer? What do you want to hear? I just want kick and snare and a little bit of overheads. Great. Here's that. And then you go around to each individual person. What do they want? And then you say, okay, play one of your songs for about 30 seconds and tell me how this feels. Like a chorus, hopefully like a heavier part of a song or like, you know, vocal heavy, kind of a lot of, yeah. yep. See how this feels. Play it back. Get feedback from every single person. Good? Were you good? Were you good? Were you good? No? Change this? Okay, done. Always go back and have the band play a portion of one of their songs because if you're just going one by one, then you're just done. Like you're, That's completely pointless. They're not hearing what it sounds when they're all playing together. Yeah. You're agreed. just ballparking a mix, which is great, but you're not taking the final step to put the period at the end of the sentence. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that that's the big thing. And if the engineer is not proposing that, then you propose it. Like, hey, let's play like 30 seconds of this song and we'll tell you if we want anything changed. Yeah. Easy. Absolutely. And it doesn't take long and it saves a lot of headache during the show. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's worthwhile letting the band sort of propose the question of like, hey, do you, would it make your life easier if we change something up here? Yeah. I mean, honestly, like that would throw me off guard and <laughs> like in a good way. That's what I mean. You know, cause I could imagine like, yeah, actually, if you could make that guitar amp less bright, cause I've got it cranked way down or, or that, yeah, turn that bass amp down a ways because yeah, I you, barely had the flat, mic on. Flatten out your EQ and your guitar a little bit. It's just yeah. a little bit harsh and I'm having to do a whole lot up here. I think it's worth trying. I would agree. No, no, no harm there. Not at all. And if they respond in a whatever bitter way, I mean, that's ultimately their problem and you're doing your best, but yeah, you, you, you want to, you want to do your best to present your arts to people because nobody else is going to care about it more than you do. So yeah. 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 And at the end of the day, you just have to put up with whatever's there. Yeah. Do your best, put on a good performance mm -hmm. and move on. Everybody does. Yeah. You're going to play those kind of shows. It's just a part of it. Sometimes the venues, the sound engineer might be the most talented sound engineer, but they're working with a half broken PA yeah. in a bad room. Yeah. They got three bands of EQ on each channel and they're trying to mix, you know, a five piece band with a horn or something. I don't know. A lot of the time the club owners or the venue owners just want you to go up there and make noise for the people who are drinking ultimately you know so yeah and i mean that that kind of brings me back to like investing in your craft obviously i realize that there's not a lot of 
a lot of money in the in the earlier stages or even a lot of the middle stages, you know. But whatever money you do have, I think it's really important to kind of have a band fund. You know, if this is something that you're taking seriously and like you want to pursue this as a group, having a band fund, I think, is massive because, you know, 50 bucks for a show here, 100 bucks for a show there. I mean, that adds up. Okay, now we can like even buy some stuff to make our lives easier on stage and have some consistency from show to show other than the actual like band equipment that we're carrying. Now, maybe we can even have our own little like little mixer, like I said earlier, for our in-ear monitors or like even our stage monitors, just like a little rack. That stuff, that's massive. Buying your own vocal mic, buying your own um, live drum mics and a little Pelican. Having those little things just bring elements of consistency to your performance, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But obviously, you know, it's different for everybody, how they kind of function with that and where the money is available. I think this whole... Uh, breakdown of sort of the local level sound check is great. Let's just kind of recap it a little bit for everybody. I think it starts with how you practice in your rehearsals. Practice as quietly as you can. Your amps probably don't need to be as loud as they are. The next thing you do, if, you, if you're not already doing this, point your amps up towards your head. You'll actually hear what's coming out of it. They're very directional. If it's pointed at your feet, it's going to sound darker. So once you point it up at your ears, you're going to realize what the tone actually is. So therefore, you can get a more balanced tone on stage, which means a more balanced tone coming to the engineer, which will help. Plus, it'll be your monitor. You probably won't need any in your monitors if it's pointed at your head. It might mean that you need to you know, set it a little bit further back in the stage. That's okay, especially bass amps. The further away they are, the more you're actually going to hear them. Yeah. Try to rehearse at a quieter level than you currently are and drummers like, buy hot rods yeah <laughs> well i mean not necessarily for a live show but no, no, yeah. no 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 but for the rehearsal space <laughs> yeah you know that way when you show up in a live venue and you have a proper or hopefully proper pa and then you pull your sticks out you're just going to be that more elated and yeah your, and your ears are going to be more adjusted to that lower volume anyway yes so you're not going to need it as loud giving the engineer an e easier canvas to present to the audience and ultimately you know, hear music and, and such. So, yeah. And then, you know, show up on time, give yourself plenty of time to load in, factor that into how early you need to be and always, always be respectful. No matter what somebody else is going through, you can't let that affect you. Just be respectful and try to communicate clearly going as far to even asking once you get through sound check, is there anything we can do to make your mix better? You might get an answer that could change the show for yeah. you guys, because you don't know what the audience is hearing always. And then I guess the last piece of the, of the recap is once you've gone individually through, everybody's got their inputs, everything's working, make sure you play at least a bit of a full song where everybody's playing, everybody sings a moment mm -hmm. so everything can get checked so everybody can understand what their monitor yep. mix feels like and you can make adjustments before you get off stage. Dot your I's, cross your T's. Yeah. Um, actually, well, I did have one other question along those lines. Because, mm -hmm. you, you know, we, we both know that once a room fills up, the room can sound entirely different. Yep. So is there something that you can kind of predict in terms of changing? So if you're a band and it's, you know, hey, this is going to sound different because it's going to be full of people. Therefore, I probably want more of. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing is depending on the space, this is all very like subjective okay. to the space, okay. but I think a big one that would affect them on stage is less about wanting more of this or that. But like, let's say in sound check, you're hearing a lot of slapback. You're doing a show and there's a concrete floor in front of you and there's no people in it. If you're expecting there to be, you know, call it a sold out or relatively full club space, you can expect that on stage, a lot of that is going to go away because what's happening is that PA is slapping up against that concrete, hitting a brick wall somewhere and coming back and hitting you in the ears. Well, that whole area is going to be filled up by essentially water. Mm -hmm. um, during showtime and all that slapback that you're hearing is going to go away. It's not something that can be just eliminated by the sound engineer, but something to keep in mind depending on the space that you're in, especially with those high frequencies. Obviously, humans tend to soak up a lot of those high frequencies quite, sure. quite well. That, and if you're the kind of person who's passionate about audio, but maybe not that educated or experienced and you're like, you know, a lead singer or something and you want to listen to how the band sounds, you're walking around out in front and you're hearing some like boominess, maybe a little bit of high mid harshness, things like that. A lot of the time, depending on the space, those things will get cleaned up, not solved, but cleaned up just by having people fill the space. Yeah. It's like taking a hall reverb and turning it into a room reverb. 
it's not going to be that boomy. It's going to be like more like this, you know, like it, yeah. it's just that transition. I, maybe that's a yeah. poor explanation, but it's, you know, it's good to keep in sonic mind. Sonic physics for sure. Yeah. yeah. One last thing before we move on from this topic, is there common kind of everyday miscommunications that you see the most from bands of like, yeah, they're saying this, but they actually mean this. Anything that you would point out to people that's like, here's some just basic things that would be helpful to communicate to your sound engineer. Yeah. Don't use adjectives that you'd have subjective explanations for. For example, I want it to be brighter. What that means to you and what that means to me is completely different. <laughs> Whatever mm. you're perceiving as bright versus whatever they may be perceiving as bright could be completely different. Be as specific as possible. I would like to hear more top end of the guitar. Excellent. We know what that sounds like. It's all your high end frequencies. Let's boost that up a little bit. Fair enough. Let's get a little bit more of that in your monitors. Don't put anything in your wedges that you don't need. Yes. It is not just a crapshoot. If you think you might not need it, you don't need it. Only put essential things in there. For instance, in small clubs, you rarely need drums. Exactly. He's right there. And you're in like a 50 by 20 space. Like yeah. The only thing that I would put in the drummer's ears is honestly, if, he, if they have like a nice little drum sub there, I'd give him a little kick so he can feel the, yeah. the low end of the yep. kick. That's great. I like that. I'm a drummer myself, so maybe that's a little bit biased. But anything that you think you may not need, like I said, you don't need it. You're eliminating stage noise by not having it in there. It's just unnecessary noise. It's just unnecessary noise. So, yeah, I think that's a big thing. Yeah, it, it goes into that problem of making your overall stage volume so loud that you can hear nothing. Yeah. It just becomes chaos. A lot of guys, too, they want, their, they want, they want it to sound on stage like it does out front. I'm like, well, that's not really how this works. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> talk about that a little bit. <laughs> I mean, especially on a large scale, you're talking about a line array, PA, you know, where yeah. you got like multi-million dollar PA with you know, 30 dual 18 inch subs out front. And then you're sitting on stage with your like 15 inch woofer wedges and you want it to sound like it does out front. I'm like, I, no, what do you turn the PA around? Like, what do you, how, this is, yeah. this is not how this works. I can't tell you how many times I've had artists go out front and be like, I love how it sounds out here. I'm like, well, thank you very much. Can we make it sound like that on stage? No, that's just not how that works. <laughs> I love that you're bringing that up actually, because I think that that's just a good perspective, like a good mindset that people have to remember that, no, it doesn't sound the same on stage. Yeah. It's not the point. It can't. No, They're no. different speakers, different spaces, the whole thing. So you have to just think about your mix as, what do I need to perform my best? Yeah. And then everything else should get cut. Yeah, exactly. Cool. You know? I have enjoyed this conversation very much. And before we wrap it up, I think everyone would be disappointed if you didn't tell me, so tell us all some really great tour you, stories. You want to hear the one, the one, the one from <laughs> I do. I do. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I was on tour with an artist. Um, this would have been spring 2022 North America tour, doing some cool spots anywhere from like 2000 to 3000 cap rooms. But we were on our way to Boston tour bus everybody was shared the same tour bus just one trailer and a box truck with all of our production we're on our way to boston and often when you're touring you know depending on routing and how things kind of work you'll have an off day in a city that you're not even performing in that gives the driver kind of a chance to sleep because having them you know drive for like 19 hours is insane and just not how things work and illegal yes exactly <laughs> not in all countries though fun <laughs> fact but anyway yeah so we get to buffalo new york which because of this i don't think i'll I don't think I really need to go to Buffalo. I don't think really anybody needs to go to Buffalo. The Sabres are cool. We like the Buffalo Sabres, but nobody really needs to go to Buffalo. We're chilling on our bus. You know, it's buses are 12 bunks traditionally. And then there's kind of a lounge towards the front and usually a lounge in the back. But in this case, because we were all on one bus, the artist had the back lounge converted to like a bedroom, which is very common. So we're all relaxing on the bus, probably about two in the morning. We're on crazy schedules because, you know, touring. All of a sudden, what I found out later to be my one of the merch guys runs on the bus and says everybody needs to get the bleep off the blood off, off the bus off the bus <laughs> you can <laughs> swear <laughs> okay <laughs> everybody needs to get the fuck off the bus so we're all like whoa what's going on i'm on my i'm on facetime with my wife you know everybody's in like their underwear and we're, we're sprinting off the bus now and right before we get up out of bed we we feel a wham I'm like, what the heck? I mean, this is a long ass tour bus and they're big and bulky and this thing is swaying. We're like, what the fuck is going on here? So we sprint off. 
all grown men, probably 13 grown ass men running off the bus in our underwear in the middle of Buffalo and probably April. So it's still pretty chilly and we're pretty far up north. Freezing our asses off. We turn around and look on the other side of the bus and there is a 18 wheeler semi truck sitting right in the side of our bus, sitting in a parking lot that just rammed into it. We're like, what? What is going on? We had an 18 wheeler. Let me say that again. An 18 wheeler rammed into the side of our tour bus. Now, what we found out was that the lady who stole this 18 wheeler, again, 18 wheeler (laughs) from like a milk factory or milk packaging plant or something as they were unloading it, she steals it and rams it in the side of our bus because she thought we were like doing surveillance or like hacking into people's oh phones my God, and things. That's so crazy. So she, apparently the security guard, he told us this, our, our security guy said that he had had a conversation with her before she did this. She's like, what are you guys doing? You look like you're hacking into things and blah, blah, blah. Just, you know, a bunch of outlandish, obviously not true mm, things. Yeah. She paranoia. leaves. Security guard, I'm not even really sure what he thought of it. I wouldn't really thought anything of it. Maybe he was a little more concerned than the rest of us because he did continue to stay outside. But yeah, so she decided I'm going to go steal this milk, this like 18 wheeler milk truck. You know, the back doors are flapping open. She would have hit us a lot harder if one, she didn't have to navigate through this parking lot. And two, if these like, you know, the cement parking lot divider things weren't there. Because what happened was, is she hit the bump right before she rammed into our bus, which was parked on the street and landed down, snapped the drive shaft and kind of continued to roll. Whoa. So I think she probably hit us at about like 10 to 15 miles per hour, which is, you know, pretty good, but we're in a big old tour bus. So I think there's, it's not like we're sitting in a Honda Civic or something. But I think if she would have paid you If she was going like 30, 40, I mean, semi truck, she hit us right in the sleeping quarters too, which is, you know, yeah. Um, But anyway, so we didn't really know if the bus was going to be drivable. We had to do like, and we have to be in Boston the next day. The bus is about to take off maybe about two hours, you know? Had to be in Boston the next day. We're having to talk talk to cops. They ended up getting her. You know, our security guard pulled a gun on her and was like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Crazy. Meanwhile, my wife is sitting on FaceTime, still open on the bus, and I'm standing outside in my underwear, freezing my ass <laughs> off with 13 other grown-ass men. Yeah, so then we didn't know if the bus was going to be drivable. Got looked like it got hit by like a meteor because there's just a big dent in the side of it, like <laughs> massive dent, 18 wheeler size dent, believe it or not. And so, yeah, we had to book flights right then and there because we didn't know if the bus was going to be drivable and essential crew. So like myself, the artist, tour manager, uh, lighting designer all got on a plane and we flew to Boston and then did a Boston show. The bus ended up being okay. So the bus showed up that night and then we had a show in New York City the next day and then we had a show back in Boston. So there was just not a lot of sleep that happened over that three in a row show. But yeah, that was definitely a that was definitely a trip. I, I haven't really had anything happen like that before <laughs> I, mean, I don't think i really ever will i don't think anyone really has yeah. <laughs> it's so hopefully yeah so weird yeah but we can laugh about it now it was you know we all kind of share that if you don't mind i did kind of have something that i wanted to bring up please um and that just kind of involves this over glorification mm. of the industry in respects to in respect to like touring and things like that Okay. I think this kind of pertains a little bit more towards techs or people who are like kind of just starting to get into stagehand work. I have a lot of people in my life who have kind of articulated to me, it's like, oh, wow, your job's so cool. Your job's so cool. And don't get me wrong. I thousand percent agree with you. I wouldn't change it for the world. Mm -hmm. But it seems like people only see what I like to call the Instagram version of what I do. Right. And what I mean by that is like, you're seeing the highlights you're saying the cool moments that I was able to capture or the cool moments that other people were able to capture that I was in, that I was tagged in on my Instagram feed or whatever. And don't get me wrong, they're very cool moments and you know memories that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. But a very important thing to understand is you are not home for months at a time. So you know, whatever job you may do now, you go home at the end of the day. We don't go home. I'm not complaining. I'm just, I'm trying to articulate that it does take a very unique, first and foremost, partner if you have a significant other to put up with that kind of insanity and also a very unique personality to deal with that chaotic environment on a day to day basis. You know, and and like I've, I've talked about, you're sharing a bus often with anywhere between six to 12 other people. On off days, you get hotels, you know. 
but you're doing 20 shows and 30 days, so that's 10 days in a hotel where you can maybe unwind if you're not sharing a room with somebody. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to not glorify the situation more because I'm not just, we're not just out there partying every night. While it is nice that you can like, you know, have a beer at front of house while you're mixing your show. But you know, when you go to a show and then you leave, well, before I'm there for probably about eight to 10 hours and after I'm there for probably about four to six hours. So what is an hour and a half for you is about 18 hours for me mm -hmm. or us rather. But yeah, if you're looking to get into the industry, specifically if you're on the tech side, because, you know, artists can just do whatever they want. <laughs> That's just the beauty of being in the artist. More power to them. But understand that it is not all fun and games. There is unique stress that I think accompanies it that people are not prepared for. And it does weed out a lot of people very, very quickly. Yeah. That on top of you also don't know when the next gig is going to be. 100%. You are the business. You and your product and your ability to hang or not hang. Yeah. yeah. It's massive stuff to to keep in mind if you want to be successful and just network your ass off. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I think yeah. that's also kind of leads me to the the last question I've been asking everybody is, you know, what what is a secret that you would like to share with everybody? It can be specific to to live audio or it could just be music in general or really life in general. If, if there's something that you want to kind of impart on on listeners, knowing that a lot of these listeners are people in local bands and that sort of thing. Any tips or any advice? Yeah, I think um, self-talk, I think that's a massive one. Mm. I think having a quality self-talk, and I'll, I'll kind of elaborate on that further, is is the difference between whatever you consider making it and not. And I, that goes for both you know, musicians and engineers. For both of us, in, in, live, in live production specifically, everything is being consumed as it's presented in the moment specifically with audio and the musicians on stage. You play a G chord on your guitar, they hear it right there. That's it. That just happened. You fuck up a G chord, they hear it right there. That just happened. I forget to unmute something for a particular song. It's right now. It's live. <laughs> it's live. Yeah. Like this is not pre-recorded, you know. So what that ends up kind of doing is you you're wearing your product on your sleeve in each and every given moment constantly when you're doing a performance mm -hmm. and that can come with a lot of self doubt mm. and if you've made it far enough where you have like techs and like you're doing relatively large scale shows you know what i'm talking about honestly this applies even more to the people who are doing shows in smaller spaces like getting down on yourself oh i played so bad tonight oh I, my mix sounded like shit tonight i didn't do it in the way i wanted to that's fine. Those are good feelings to have. I think those are really, really important feelings to have. But what's even more important is getting to the next phase. And the next phase is reflection. Okay, why? Why didn't I like what I did there? Especially if this is like you're doing the same set list, you know, for multiple nights mm -hmm. or whatever for, for the foreseeable future, if it's a tour, whatever. What can I fix? How, how can I make sure that doesn't happen again? Like for me personally, from like an audio perspective, it's like, damn it. What's his face? His guitar solo wasn't where I wanted it to be tonight. We were in a bigger space and his guitar patch was a little bit washy. I'm going to ask him to pull back on the reverb a little bit so I can bring out some more enunciation, I guess, on his guitar because we're doing big rooms or whatever. Reflect. Be hard on yourself, but don't let it last too long because you can spiral down. Mm. So having that self-talk where you're like, damn, that was shitty. Why was it shitty? It's not going to be shitty next time. The way I handle it might be kind of unhealthy, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I think like it's important to take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. But like for me, how I tend to approach this is I'm really, really hard on myself with these types of things, like really hard. And to be honest with you, oftentimes when I'm the hardest on myself is when people think that it sounded the best, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Maybe it's because I'm asking how it sounded more during those moments, probably. Ultimately, you have to think that you're the best at what you're doing. And I'm not saying that in like an egotistical way. And I'm not even saying that you share that with other people. This all comes back to the self-talk that I've been just trying to reiterate. I'm here for a reason. I'm the best. Nobody can mix this better than I can. Even if it's not true, it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah. I would just say that in a slightly different way. It's just no one can mix it like you. Yeah, yeah, that's probably better. Probably the more healthy way that I was talking about. It. You know, because that is true. Yeah. That your unique perspective is worthy. Yeah. 
and how you do it or perform it, whether you're the engineer or the artist, it's what you bring. Right. And people are there for you. You're there because you were hired. Finding the confidence in those moments where you feel like you did a terrible job is really, really difficult sometimes. It's a balance. But I think you I think the way you laid it out makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of artists on both sides of the mic Mm -hmm. or both sides of the stage have those kind of thoughts often of, hey, this didn't go the way I wanted it to go. And that can range in severity from Mm -hmm. I'm worthless, I'm terrible at this to just a subtle, oh, I need to fix that. Yeah. What matters is that it's okay to be honest with yourself and have critiques. You just got to work to the solution. Yeah. If you're not working towards, okay, now what am I going to do about it? Right. Then it's just damaging. Yeah. Then you're just spiraling. Then you're just spiraling. It's nothing. Everything has to be a lesson. If you can frame everything as, what can I learn from this? You'll be okay. Yeah. Everything can be a lesson. If you stop looking for the lesson, then it will just be damaging and it will just waste your time and energy. Yep, exactly. And ultimately damage your career if you can't find your, you know, way out of it to the next step. Sure. I can promise you this. The big thing that every artist that I've worked with have in common is that they've all dealt with this. Every engineer that I've worked with, every lighting designer, every tour manager, every artist. That is one thing all of us share. We have those moments where it's just like, oh, gosh, I just want to forget that show. So, you know, it kind of puts you on an even playing field in that respect. And it's kind of humbling, too, at the same time to know that, like, you know, the the person you're trying to make sound good on stage can have shitty nights, too. And it's not just always, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone does. Yeah. Because even if you're at the top of your game, like you're one of the most sought after yeah. live engineers, you're just recalibrating how yep. you feel about yourself. Exactly. Right now, your own expectations are that much higher. Yep. You know, a a few episodes ago, we had Lane Peterson on, who's the drummer for Dillinger 4. Yeah. And he made a a really cool point. He was just like, listen, train wrecks happen, like on stage, they happen. Like the worst possible thing you can do is be like, like sulk. Yeah. And, and, and let everyone know that that was such a disaster. Cause he's like, so much people don't even notice. Yeah. They don't notice. It's more of your own thing. A thing that I, I like to say from like a technical perspective on that, it's, you know, because technology, right? In one way or another, more than likely things are bound to fail at some point on a tour or whatever. Yeah. And whatever that may be, like an XLR cable goes bad, a microphone goes bad mid-show, whatever. But it's not about whether or not something goes wrong, because it probably will. It's about what you do when it does and your ability to kind of recover or pivot in those situations is massive. Yeah. Ultimately, what I do for a living during the show is troubleshoot. Yeah. Why does that sound bad? Because this, okay. (laughs) You know, I mean, that's the simplest way to put it. We're just glorified troubleshooters. Yeah. How do we make the (laughs) best of what we've got? Yeah. And I think artists are dealing with that all the time. Yeah. All the time. How do we make this the best show we can given these circumstances? Exactly. And if you can have some poise and keep a positive attitude and just think of what can be learned for next time, yeah, you'll be all right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being here, man. Yeah. This no, whole conversation's really been great. Yeah. If people wanted to reach out or connect with you, is there, do you want to give them any like socials or anything yeah. like that? I just changed it because I used to have it as at audio files are hot, but <laughs> trying to articulate that to people in loud clubs is tend, tends to be challenging. So it's just at joey.vesuvius if you have any questions or want to reach out on Instagram. So I'll put that link in our show notes. Yeah. And anything else that you want to send people to? No, I mean, that's pretty much all I got. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again, man. I really no, appreciate I was, yeah, it. Me too. And I wish you the best on the next tour. Sounds good. We'll have to do this again. Yeah. Yearly recap, maybe. I'll, I'll see if I can get some better <laughs> stories for next time. Well, all hopefully right. not too much better. No, no, one. no. <laughs> no more milk trucks. <laughs> all right, man. Till next time. Thank you.